Our first witness on this panel is Philip Bell, President of the Steel Manufacturers Association. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to thank uh, Madam Secretary Pritzker as well as Ambassador Froman for convening this hearing. We're here today to talk about a very serious subject and I appreciate the opportunity to share ideas with you. The SMA also looks forward to working with the U.S. delegation at the high-level steel meeting next week in Brussels, and we appreciate the work you've done on trade enforcement and also leading the global effort to deal with overcapacity. I'm Philip Bell. I'm president of the Steel Manufacturers Association. The SMA represents 28 North American steel producers, primarily in the electric arc furnace segment of the industry. 63% of all steel made in the United States is made via the electric arc furnace process. SMA members collectively account for over 75% of domestic steel making capacity, and they directly employ 60,000 workers across North America and indirectly generate an additional 400,000 jobs. SMA is deeply concerned about the high level of global steel overcapacity. Despite being the safest, most productive, and sustainable steel producers in the world, SMA members are finding it increasingly difficult to compete against foreign steel producers who have received enormous subsidies and other forms of support from their governments. These policies have driven the buildup of world steelmaking capacity far beyond any rational levels and have fundamentally distorted the global steel market. The effect of global overcapacity has been, quite simply, to flood the U.S. market with imported steel. We heard it yesterday. We heard it this morning. In 2015, import market share reached a record level of 29 percent. Major steel producers, including China, Japan, Korea, and Turkey, produced significantly more steel than they could consume internally. Because the U.S. is a large market with no barriers to entry, much of this excess production found its way here. The impact on the domestic steel industry has been devastating. Production in 2015 was approximately 78.8 million metric tons, a decline of more than 27 percent from 2014. The industry's overall capacity utilization rate barely reached 70 percent and was well below what is considered healthy. Several major American steel mills have closed. Indeed, over the past two years, the United States has reduced its steel making capacity by around 10 million tons. In 2015 alone, laid off 12,000 workers, or 8% of its total workforce. The impact is not limited to the steel industry. Each steel job supports approximately seven jobs in associated industries, both upstream and downstream. When the U.S. steel industry lost 12,000 jobs last year, it's likely that another 84,000 jobs in supporting industries also disappeared. It's unrealistic to assume that market forces alone can eliminate this disparity. Rather, restoring balance to industry will require coordinated action by the global steelmaking community. While such action has been discussed for a number of years, these discussions have yet to yield sufficient results. This does not mean that the United States should abandon any attempt to bring rationality to the global steel industry, but it does demonstrate that the U.S. may need to act on its own to ensure that its steel producers and their workers and customers are not driven out of business by imports. The SMA recommends the following five prescriptions as part of a broad-based effort to limit the further expansion of steel capacity in the world and to bring that capacity into line with world demand. Number one, strict enforcement of trade remedy laws. The United States generally is the market of last resort for overproduction around the world. Strict enforcement of the anti-dumping and countervailing duty laws will ensure that imports compete with domestic steel production on a fair basis. We feel that Congress has given the Commerce Department the tools to do this. In this respect, it's also essential that the United States continue to treat China as a non-market economy for anti-dumping purposes until China can establish under U.S. law that it is entitled to market economy treatment. A recent report calculates that the premature extension of market economy status to China could result in a loss of up to 595,000 jobs in the United States. The United States is under no obligation to treat China as a market economy, and it should decline to do so until China can show that it is, in fact, one. Number two, the SMA believes in binding international commitments to limit capacity expansion. 
The OECD estimated in 2015 that the world would add about 197 million metric tons of new steelmaking capacity by 2017. This is an increase of 9% over current levels. The vast majority of this increase will occur in Asia, primarily in India and China. Given the current weak state of global demand for steel, there is no justification for an expansion of this magnitude. The first step in bringing capacity into line with demand is to restrict capacity expansion. Number three, we believe in binding international commitments to reduce capacity. It is clear that several countries, including China, Japan, Korea, and Turkey, have significantly more steelmaking capacity than market conditions can justify. It is unlikely that demand will expand sufficiently to bring production into line with that capacity. The only viable solution is an international capacity reduction agreement between governments. This agreement must be binding and it must be verifiable. In considering the necessary magnitude of reductions in capacity, it is essential to keep in mind the effect of capacity creep. China, for example, has stated that it will take 150 million tons of capacity out of production over a five-year period. Over that same five-year period, however, China would add another 77 million tons of effective capacity because of capacity creep. Ignoring this phenomenon would result in much smaller reductions than are necessary. The government should focus on net capacity reduction as part of any agreement. Fourth, the international agreement limiting government support for interfe the interference in the steel industry is absolutely vital. Subsidies and other forms of government support are the single largest factor driving the overexpansion of global steelmaking capacity. And disciplining the other ways governments interfere with the operation of the market, the imbalance between capacity and demand is likely to continue. And finally, there should be strict limits on multilateral and export bank lending on steel projects. Lending by multilateral development organizations and national export banks has been another significant source of funding capacity expansion. An international agreement should strictly limit such multilateral and national lending on steel-related pro projects. In conclusion, the global steel industry is in a state of crisis because of enormous overcapacity in China, Turkey and a number of other countries. This overcapacity exists largely because of government policies. These policies have had a direct and damaging impact on the American steel industry and threaten its long-term survival. The United States should lead international efforts to limit new capacity and to remove unneeded capacity. And until this occurs, the United States should vigorously enforce its trade laws in respect to steel imports. At the end of the day, the domestic steel industry wants what any industry wants. We want the ability to help our customers build their businesses, their employees build their lives, and the communities where we operate to build their futures. Thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to share ideas with you this morning.